Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Forecast is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Forecast is brought to you by MailRoute.info. MailRoute is a secure hosted service that provides enterprise-grade virus and spam filtering to companies of any size. Try it right now absolutely free at MailRoute.info. What sort of future do you think we're heading for? How will we live as we slip into the 21st century? Welcome to Forecast, episode 60. I'm Tom Merritt. And I'm Scott Johnson. And this is, once again, Forecast. The show yes. where we forecast things with four people, in case you hadn't figured that part out yet. Well, really, we do the easy part, right? We show up. We have two amazing guests on each and every week. We make them make predictions and use their brains. And then we just riff on it like a couple of dumb stumps. Shh, 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 Scott, the <laughs> guests are listening. I feel Holy used. <laughs> Uh, pay no attention to Scott Johnson. Joining us today are Jerry Ellsworth, self-taught electrical engineer, ex-race car driver, and aspiring improv actress. Welcome, Jerry. Ah, great to be on. It's, it's great, <laughs> great to have you. Also joining us, Christina Warren, writer for Mashable, co-host of Briefly Awesome, and a sometimes designer. Hello, Christina. Hello. Good to have you guys both today. Uh, very, very happy uh, that you could join us. Uh, and do a little predicting with us. We always start just to warm you up with a prediction from a listener. And uh, I've got one today from Tim the Techie in Texas. Uh, he says, I enjoyed listening to episode 59. It seems that everyone has the foresight to envision a virtual world that we'll be able to upload our consciousness into. To me, this sounds like pure heaven. This new age neural network could be the last stop for our minds after our physical bodies are retired. Those of us who've not yet passed on into virtual Valhalla would still be able to interact with our long gone but not forgotten friends and family either via view portals a la Max Headroom, traditional VR gear, or mind machine interfaced excursions into cyberspace. We'll finally be able to attend our own funerals and actually show our youngsters the better place that grandma has gone to. I believe that the future humans, cyborgs, and virtualized minds will coexist in such a way that gives everyone a full, meaningful, and possibly perpetual existence. So this is different than our usual thing that we talk about. Usually what we say is, all right, one of these days in the far-off future, we'll all be able to download our consciousness or upload it to some sort of cloud-based solution. <laughs> and in that solution, we would therefore no longer have need of these bodies. We would have this virtual existence that is as good as the real one and, and create our worlds and whatever. What he's suggesting is this is a, an end-of-life solution. This is a 85-year-old guy dies but two months before you know sat down with his lawyer uploaded all of his stuff and now he can live on in this place and his grandkids which still walk and breathe on this planet can kind of still communicate with him and, and connect with him i think that's a great twist on an already popular topic right here on forecast Yes, but i'm going to be awful bitter by the time i'm kicking off so i don't <laughs> think anyone's going to want me around like, just oh, be this Grandma Ellsworth just bitching about how the youngins <laughs> don't understand, like, how it was when we had Commodore 64s. Stop <laughs> IMing me, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's sort of like a, the, the, the movie Vanilla Sky, kind of, except, you know, you'd be able to access other people's data. Yeah, kind of, yeah, yeah, for ab absolutely. Uh, and 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 think of all the virtual worlds that you could go in and hang out with all the dead people. What I'm See, that would be cool. What I'm wondering here too is, uh, could you do this retroactively somehow? Would we have Ooh. the ability to go dig Jim Morrison up, <laughs> scan his brain in, and then you know have have the ability to you know hang out, write music, play some tunes, jam, to recreate his, uh, the Algonquin Roundtable? Yeah. 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 You could I'd hate you could that actually, job to have to you, you dig bring, up some decomposed corpse. You could bring Jim Morrison to the court hearing, that whole thing going on in Miami about whether or not it was, you know, indecent exposure or not or whatever. You could bring him back and give him some, you know, some end game here. Because otherwise, what do we care? He's gone. It's kind of like a weird thing that we're even talking about it. But let him come back and see the results of his little flash, you know, 
thing he did back then. And get to say, was Val Kilmer really accurate? Right. Right. Yeah, no kidding. You could just say, you know, no more Val Kilmers. We'll just have Jim Morrison play Jim Morrison in the movie. And then you could see oh. which one was, who was worse. <laughs> and, 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 and and I think that the, that, uh, the Jim might win that. I don't know. He, he, that's, he might. Uh, that's a tough call. You're right. Yeah. All we all we know is uh, Jim Morrison is probably more intact as Jim Morrison now than Val Kilmer is intact as Val Kilmer now. <laughs> Just a thought. <laughs> Chew on that, Internet. And with that, <laughs> we invite you to send us your predictions to forecastpodcast gmail.com or you can post them up at the blog forecastpodcast.com. Let's get into the short term predicting, shall we? Uh, Jerry, we're going to start with you. These are things you think will happen sooner than later. Let's start with your short-term prediction. I'm going to predict that uh, home medical scanners are going to become ubiquitous. There's already a lot of research in uh, microfluidics where we could take swabs of our mouth and put it on a microchip and then bust up the molecules and run them through these little channels that will sort out the di different markers in our, uh, in our biological makeup. Um, so, the, so like like MRIs, that kind of stuff, like it'd be able to come home and go, oh, I get this, this is a worse than a normal headache. There's something up. We'll just pull out the portable MRI helmet and see what what's up. Is that that kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah. I think that's going to be here very soon, especially in, uh, NMRI. Um, superconductors are approaching the, the temperature of room temperature. So for magnetic resonance um, imaging, you've got to have superconducting magnets and now they're almost within reach to do in your home so we could start out with a, a new one that's small enough you could just put your finger in there and it vibrates all the the atoms in your finger and says oh you've got mercury poisoning Ooh, i hate that so, so like I, I love this idea scanner. because <clears throat> it seems like um you know if you if we go back to i don't know let's go back to 1850 and we say uh oh junior over here's got a real bad cough and we don't know what to do with it well consumption today, that <laughs> Today, that, that, that cough can be treated and self-diagnosed and taken care of kind of at home without ever really leaving. I mean, yeah, it can escalate and get to something worse and pneumonia or whatever. But, but you know, the common cold is, is nothing these days. But back then, that meant you had to go see Doc Brown up the road. Well, not that Doc Brown because he'd take you back in time. But any old Doc <laughs> Brown. And he would have to go through all sorts of rigmarole to kind of help you out and make sure things were okay. And a lot of it was, you know, a bunch of baloney. It's not that far-fetched to me to think that we are living in a time now where this seems crazy that I have my own personal MRI, the thing that now takes up a whole room and costs, you know, $10,000 to do a, a simple thing if you don't have insurance, that that would someday be, a, you know, something I, just, I could pick up myself, bring home, and for, you know, 100 bucks, I'd be able to tell whether or not I had, quote-unquote, mercury poisoning. I think that's a pretty, a pretty safe bet, actually. I, I, it's going to happen. I know it's going to happen. And with the computing power that we have today, we wouldn't even have to have a doctor there to analyze the images. Um, someday, real soon, they'll be able to uh, measure all these different metrics from your body and say, all right, you have cancer. And think how cool Ancestry.com will be when you've got your home DNA scanner. You just upload the profile and then it matches yep. it. And for $50, we'll give you your entire, you know, genetic history and who you're related to like that. Uh, I love that idea. Someone in the chat room mentioned uh, vague, it looks like, it says, I heard that there will be uh, STD tests on your cell phone soon. I hadn't heard that, but... You can see that. I mean, you know what? I mean, what are blood tests for uh, folks with yeah. diabetes and things now? They're just pricking your skin, checking the blood. Your Why cell are you phone peeing on your that. cell phone? Eh, it's home pregnancy <laughs> test. <laughs> so yeah, but I mean, you know, if you if you want to, I don't know. There's some hot girl you want to date, and you're like, well, I don't know. She, you know, got to make sure she's she's clean. Step <laughs> Never, over you know. to my syphilis pod, please. <laughs> <laughs> By Apple. Well, that's the thing, right? It's great to it's have all these IVD. home. <laughs> IVD. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have all these home scanners, uh, but we need home curator, curers too. You know, you want the all-in-one. It's like the multifunction printer. It, yes, it, it you want diagnoses. Yes, the doctor too. Yeah, diagnoses and cures. Love it. All in one. I like it. All right, G good prediction, Jerry. Christina, we will switch over to you. Uh, when you look into your short-term crystal ball, what do you see? Okay, so mine is not nearly as, as interesting, but uh, I think that the paperless office that we were promised like 25 years ago is actually going to happen. I think that we're actually going to be in a place where- Wait, wait, wait. Paper... This isn't the crazy prediction yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
No, but think about it. I mean, not saying that all paper is going to go away, but think about like how often in your regular life do you actually print something out or use something on a piece of paper? Instead, we're transitioned to screens, whether they're screens you hold in your hand or they're screens that you you know have on your desk or um, or whatever. And uh, I mean, they even have paper that can be erased and, and reprinted on. So it's becoming less and less of of, of, of a use case thing. And I, I think that the paperless office is actually going to happen. Tablets I think they kind just, of bring us that way, don't they? I mean, the fact, the fact that you have something in your hand that you can show Because you can hold something. it. Yeah, you can yeah. flip through. You can access the documents, which is the, whole, which is the whole reason that I think the paperless office never took off to begin with. People still need to be able to portably transport something. And you can't do that as well as a laptop. And, um, you know, phones are, are great, but you can't see things quite the same way. But if you have your tablet, you know, your iPad, whatever, you can have all of your documents right there that you can access and interact with and skip to the next one. So Christina brings up, I mean, you're almost channeling my day to day. We had, I had a real problem with the printer and most of it had to deal with my daughter's uh, report. She had to get to a uh, class and the, the, the fight we were having was the printer was just struggling on the network and we couldn't get the network mm -hmm. reset the way we needed. And it was this big mess. And she sends me these PDF files to print. And while I'm trying to get these three PDF files that she knew how to create, she made them in Word and here they are, brand new PDFs, portable document format, anybody can open them. And I'm thinking, why am I, what are we doing? Why, am, why is this stuff not in the inbox of her teacher at the very least? Exactly. And why are they not being graded that way? Like that kind of stuff drives me crazy sometimes because I just think, well, they're being told they have to hand it in printed. Is it because he doesn't know what he's doing? Is it because the school wants, you know, I don't know what the policy is that sort of affects this thing. It's policy what for do policy you see? sake. So what do you see as um, the impetus for getting that policy to change? Is there, a, is there a sea change you can point to or is it more complicated than that? Well, I think that what would probably happen, I mean, like look at the iPad, which is already being, you know, investigated to be adopted in, in schools, you know, K through 12, you know, colleges, whatever. If everybody had a tablet device by whatever and it was issued in a class and all your textbooks are there, then conceivably all of your documents could be there too. And you could simply just send your document from your, your computer, your laptop, your tablet, whatever, to your, your teacher's computer. And it could all be, you know, um, authenticated and, and have like a, a signature, so to speak, on it so that it, it, it's known that it was created by you and your user account. And there you go. You can turn in your math homework. Yeah, I don't yeah, see why like if, we, if we, can, uh, we can sign papers and fax them, why right. you couldn't just sign something digitally and fax it. In fact, when, when I signed up for my ISP, I, I got a business account. Uh, that's exactly what I did. They offered me the, the ability to do a digital signing. Uh, and and send it to them, submit it to them that way, and that was the contract. There was never any paper exchanged. One kind of cool uh, step in this direction. Um, our uh, Tom, you and I have a mutual friend, Liam O'Brien, who works as a voice actor in California, and he does a lot of cartoons and TV stuff and video games and things like that. And he was telling me the other day. He actually called specifically to tell me this for the first time ever. He had sat down with some agents and some producers, and they had signed a deal for him to do a, a project or a job, and they pulled out an iPad and had this, and I can't remember the name of this app. I wish I could remember it, but it was an app specific for this kind of thing that literally had the document, the, the non-disclosure and everything else, you know, written out, handed it over to him. The little signing era area blew up kind of Walmart style when you're checking out. And with his mm -hmm. finger, he just signed his name, legal, done, out. And everybody had PDFs in their inbox, like right then when hitting the send button. And it was, it was totally brilliant. I feel like that kind of stuff uh, and it, whether it's iPads or 100 other devices or all of them adopting standards or whatever, it doesn't matter to me. It seems like these kinds of baby steps will lead ultimately to us getting away from paper as a as the must have means for, you know, for contracting or uh, submitting information or transferring, you know, ownership or whatever. I finally so just got the ability to to submit my rent check electronically. <laughs> that's it. You know, that's it's a very small piece of paper that that's one less check. Mm -hmm. that I have to write. Jerry, what do you think? Do you think we'll get a paperless office? Oh, definitely. Yeah, with uh, e-paper, um, uh, it's, it's kind of metastable, permanent uh, a display where it takes no electricity. I don't see why you couldn't just have um, tablets of e-paper that get downloaded with all the contents of the book or whatever you want to read. Um, I'm all for it. I, I have a, a fax that I have to send off, and I can't, I haven't, I haven't found my scanner since my move, so what have a pain in the ass. Have you thought about taking a, uh, a picture of it? I did that <laughs> I one, did that. one time. I had a one sheet that I, had to, I was supposed to fax 
And I was like, well, forget, I, I can't. I, I was in a position where I just could not get to a fax machine. So I took a picture of it, and then I used uh, one of the online fax programs to send it. I it was a long to let time me ago, submit but. a YouTube video of it. Yeah. <laughs> Here's every line. Just <laughs> and I'm like, not I'm not here to shill apps necessarily, but there is an app on the iPhone called JotNot and uh, yeah. JotNot Pro, I guess. And that's great for that. You can actually take a picture of any document. It will then convert it to, it looks like a fax. It's like fax quality image, all white background, looks like a piece of paper. And if it's a receipt or whatever, it doesn't matter. You can have that thing signed and some other, you know, I tell, pull that into another app on my iPad, sign it digitally, send it back. And then you can fax that or send that PDF or, you know, convert it to a hundred other formats. It's pretty slick that way. So do your part, people. If you have an iPhone or an Android phone and you find an app like this, start using it for crap like this and maybe we'll get there quicker. Yeah. And save the trees to be cut down for Christmas. Let's move on to our long-term <laughs> prediction. These are longer view predictions, more the in 100 years, we'll all be in flying cars sorts of stuff. And uh, we'll stay with you, Christina. Uh, what do you see as your long-term prediction? Okay, so I'm really interested in textiles, and I'm really interested in clothing. And when I was uh, watching uh, Tron Legacy, um, which, which officially opens on, on Friday, um, I was like floored with the costuming and how they did the costumes for the movie. And what they did is, is to get the measurements right, they took lasers and actually scanned the bodies and whatnot so that they could have these these perfectly, you know, pitch perfect outfits. So to take something like that, but to the next level, I'm thinking, why can't we have something like that, but but spray paint clothes? So, you know, spray on clothing is, is, is where, uh, is, is my long-term prediction, spray on clothing that completely conforms to fit your body. So instead of having to, you know, put on a, a jacket or whatever, you can just spray spray yourself into um, something trendy and, and cute. Will your fancy technology, <laughs> will it allow me to still, because I got about 15 pounds I'd like to shed. Will your fancy, <laughs> I, uh, what I'm saying is I don't, don't want. Don't spray <laughs> horizontal stripes, Scott. Well, we'll see. Right. What if you had like a spray on girdle? Ah, uh -huh. so a frame, uh -huh. some sort of frame thing. Exactly, exactly. So you can spray something on that it'll automatically contort, you know, conform to your shape and, and, and suck things in or, or push things up or whatever. Spray well, on researchers are working on this stuff called metamaterials, which um, can bend light. And, uh, you know, we've been hearing about it a lot in the news lately about cloaking devices. So maybe that could be implemented to... Uh, um, make you look skinnier by passing light straight through. Ooh. Yeah. Little meta That's material. That's with cloaking devices because then right. you could have your invisible, you could have your invisible jacket and just be like a walking head. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's that, awesome I'm, for I'm Halloween. Just, well, if you're spray on you technique, why not just spray it all over your face too? There you go. There you go. Yeah. Invisibility. There you go. What yeah, a nice uh, feature. There's a uh, story that, uh, uh, who is this? Yeah, Captain Kipper put in the chat room, make clothes out of a can with spray-on fabric from Wired, uh, September 16th, 2010. And they've got pictures of a guy getting a T-shirt sprayed on him. Yeah, I saw this. It's chopped up like cotton, cotton fibers that are sprayed yeah. out of like a, a thing that you might use to make a fiberglass uh, boat. Spray on oh, latex. So it's kind of crisscrossed, and uh, so the fibers cross each other, that kind of thing, like fiberglass works. That's kind of cool. Yeah. So, so okay, here's, so here's my next thing. Why don't we skip that part and go straight to, here's what I want to do. I'm going to walk into an Abercrombie and Fitch or something and say. No, you don't. Hey, okay, I don't want to walk in there. I want to walk into a gap because that's how I roll. <laughs> and I want to say to that lady, <laughs> I really want. Those pants, that jacket, that hat, whatever, all those, this co combination of things, but I want it suited best for my shape, size, arm length, everything else. And then they put me into a little room, they scan me, kind of Tron style. And then I come back a day later and I've got my outfit perfectly tailored. I mean, basically we're just talking yes. about tailoring, but artificially, perfectly tailored for me. And how they make that, you know, if that clothing's made out of nano machines, I don't care. But what I want is still the feel of clothes. And not just, you know, sprayed on crotch tight horribleness. <laughs> I want to so, like, so you want you know, the clueless, you want, you want the clueless computer that, that picks out all the outfits and whatnot, but you want it completely custom tailored to your body type. Correct. I want it to, I want to be able to pick the style and say, well, I'm really digging those jeans, but make them perfectly suited for my legs and my waist and everything else. 
And by everything else, I have no idea what I mean. I want Jerry's I scanner want to not only diagnose my mercury poisoning, but scan me and spit out clothing that is tailored to that. Not to the Piece mercury of cake. poisoning. Piece of to cake. Me. Yeah. Just a combo unit. In real, in real time, so you could, you know, it's like an inpatient deal where you walk into the gap, you say, this is what I want. I don't want to have to walk to the gap. Out. I just want to be, do it at home. <laughs> oh, I see. And then it, it a three- could download patterns from, from various, like, retailers or from designers. Designers could upload their, their, their patterns and then have yes. them automatically configured to fit your body. That would be pretty cool. And then your spray-on devices are working like a 3D printer, and you just, you know, walk into your shower or something, and the, and the spray just sprays the pattern perfectly, and then, boom, you've got, you've got your jeans and your, your shirt. But, I, Tom, Tom, what would all our girlfriends and wives do on the weekends for fun with each other? They would have nowhere to go. <laughs> They can't just sit around the house going, oh, these look great. I'll try that on. I mean, they want a shop. They want to walk through that place. They want they want rooms to change in. That's yeah. virtual reality. You, mm-hmm. you have virtual reality shopping experiences. Where you put on a helmet, a VR helmet, and then you get to experience what it was like before everything was done for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, Scott. <laughs> With your grandparents. The, these are my favorite yes, predictions. Exactly. With my, your grandparents who were bitching about, in, in my day, it was so hard to do this and that. And, and your, you know, little life pod thing. Uh, we actually had to the ones buy we clothes. That. Yes. We'll start with a prediction. We'll find a hole in it. We find another prediction that will fit that. Those are my <laughs> favorites, actually. And I mean that. I actually really enjoy those because, you know, all these things are very complicated. If we really look at, look at all the predictions forecasts has ever had, none of them break down to, you know, simple possibility without a lot of sort of underpinnings and, and invention and, and inspiration and everything else that comes along. And, and without all of that, we don't really know what we end up getting. So I like when we have to fill holes with, with other awesome things that need their own holes filled. When you're doing the virtual reality shopping, you can actually be shopping not only with your friends, but with resurrected celebrities who had their brains scanned. Whoa. Oh, my God. How cool would that be to be like shopping with Cher? Yeah. <laughs> and there, and because it's the internet, <laughs> or scary, there's like an infinite. Well, shares yeah, shares like a yeah. cloud service, so there's plenty of share for everyone to go shopping with. Exactly, you can share share. share. So I can take share from um, uh, Moonlight, right? Or Moon Moonstruck was it? Whatever it was Moonstruck. But she's she's kind of nice, you know, sweet lady, whatever. I don't want to take, I could turn back time, share with like the thong and everything. I don't have to walk around the store with her, right? You can wh- whichever I, share you want. That is the I, I only want time Bob Mackie share, share always. Share. Always, I want Bob, Bob Mackie share. So, you know, the, the crazier the better, because no one, no one wore a, no one wears a red carpet dress like Share. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to uh, Jerry's long-term prediction. When you look into a uh, hundred years or more, what do you see? Well, this is very uh, on topic. My prediction is that we're going to have MEMS building machines, micro machines that can build everything for us, kind of like Star Trek's um, uh, thing that spits food out. Um, oh, replicators. Yeah, replicators. And I think it's going to be done with technology that we're working on today, like uh, things like uh, quantum teleportation, where you can separate two um, photons and, and put them hundreds of miles apart. And then you can instantly transmit data by um, just touching one of these photons or super dense coding, which will solve our memory storage problem on these little tiny robots by using the superposition of electrons and their spin. And uh, But we have a lot of things we have to overcome before we can do that. Um, so you would, up- you would entangle shares photons with the MEMS <laughs> that work with your virtual reality machine and then... Exactly, exactly. Yeah. The problem is whenever you touch one of those photons, then they become untangled and yeah. it's a problem. But one of the biggest problems with doing this is going to be getting power to these little devices. Um, if you want to pick up an atom and move it, the uh, forces that are on two atoms that are close to each other are mm-hmm. so great that um, currently it takes tons of energy just to move a couple atoms. And IBM's working on this with huge machines, but someday we'll have a power source that we can put on a little little tiny speck of sand that can move around and do this stuff for us. I read something about a, uh, a design innovation that was able to take vibrational kinetic energy and because of the way that the, the machine was designed, it was, it was a, you know, a very small nano machine, it was able to direct that 
to continually move forward and even do turns. Ooh, excellent. And it was, mm, it, was, awesome. it was sort of like a ratcheting effect, like it wouldn't roll backwards because, and, and so it would take, it would only use the energy that directed it in the way that it needed to go. Well, there's a lot of ways to get um, power into these devices. You can beam microwaves in, uh, you could use an electron beam. Um, the, the problem is we can't just hook up wires to these little things and have an external battery pack because it would be like trying to hook jumper cables onto yeah, right. uh, an ant or something and expect it to drag those around. You need, the, you need the equivalent of the, uh, the kinetic watch, you know, that's powered ah. by your motion, essentially. Well, basically, yeah. yeah. I, was, I was actually just going to say that. If you could figure out a way to, to you know, build kinetic power into, into small, smaller and smaller entities, uh, for a bit, lack of a better word, that seems like a, think, a, a decent way to get power. I think our devices will get smarter, too. We'll use the natural resonance of these bonds inside of atoms so we can, these little robots can sit there and beam photons between atoms and get them vibrating back and forth until they can pop the atom off of the bond. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way, kind of like Tesla and his uh, earthquake machine, right. you, know, you just kind of slowly put a little bit of energy into the system until you bust these bonds apart. Mm -hmm. And then you can well, move them wherever you want. Here's a quick question about the, 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 the replicator thing. So I'm no quantum physicist, okay? <laughs> um, but it seems to me like we should be a lot closer to duplicating things than we are about breaking them up or separating them or whatever. Is the process the same? Is it just as hard for me to say, all right, well, here's a, a, a I don't know, an egg, and I, and I want another one of those eggs, and I want to clone it, basically. What, what, is, what is involved in that that is so difficult for mankind to get their head around where in my logical side of my brain says, well, no, we should be, we duplicate lots of things. We figured out a way to duplicate almost everything in this world. We've, we duplicated a sheep for heaven's sakes. Can we just, can we just make that egg double up? What is holding by, us back? From by that? atom by atom? Just like, yeah. uh, the atoms are slippery things and just moving them one at a time is difficult because, uh, it's, you just can't go over with a little grappler and grab them and move them. You kind of have to use electrostatics to, to pick them up and move them around. And, you know, they disappear um, as you're moving them. I mean, it's a, it's a huge task that IBM was able to spell their, their name in, uh, I can't remember what, at gold atoms, I think, on a piece of silicon. It was just phenomenal that they could do that. Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's like... Um if you if, pick up a, a, a snowball versus picking up one flake. Exactly, exactly. I dare you, Johnson. Pick up one flake. <laughs> but, really th there's a lot idea. of people working on this stuff today. Even at a hobbyist level, there's 3D printers in people's homes that um, call like the RepRap. So there's very ambitious projects of self-replicating machines and you know, just keep building on that over the next hundred years. We'll have some pretty cool technology for making stuff at home so we don't have to go out. Jerry, could you use this in your spray on clothing idea, you think? All right, oh, I'm sorry, bet, Christina. Yeah. yeah. Oh, my gosh. Absolutely. I mean, you could you could replicate the, all kinds of materials or you wouldn't even have to have the spray on necessarily. You just, you know, use it to, I really like these pants. Now let's replicate them in, you know, with this material. Could the pants be yeah. made of the MEMS and then they could just kind of change the pants so you wouldn't have to even change, Ooh. you know, it's, you're going into the club, you, you go from your, your daytime. It automatically can like change based on like light sources around you yeah. or other, that would be kind of cool. Wow. They're going to really have to suss out that technology though. Cause I could see Tom at like his future Ted talk and we all know what's coming. He's going to be standing up there on mic and all of a sudden his pants are going to get like some air and just run <laughs> off somewhere. <laughs> Whoa. That's, that's, you, the, man. that's the future nightmare everyone has. I was on stage and my pants fled. Yes, not, not, not that you know you were on stage naked, but that your, your pants ran away from you. Yeah. <laughs> I hate that dream. <laughs> I think it could be very exciting having hybrid materials. So what if you want light-up clothing? So you could have yes. mic micro LEDs built into it and you could be a walking display or uh, um, something that exudes a smell. So it's just uh, it, you know giving off these uh, smell particles. Yeah, Tom's do that now. But I was going to say one last thing. 
Um, I'm just giving Tom, I'm giving Tom our time today. Um, it, I like the idea that you could go to an, an artisan pants maker, like someone who goes to the old world method of making a pair of jeans and they sew them by hand and it's very careful and everything. And then those are the basis for replication. So people can still get the, the feel that they like of that kind of cotton or of that shape or that style or whatever. That way you kind of satisfy that need we all have to have sort of a nostalgic feel for things. We all want to get antiques. We all want to, you know, we, all, we want our fancy new computers, but I want that old painting on the wall. And that, there, there's a way, I think, in that world to be able to say, all right, well, here's an old thing. Now let's make lots of them. And I know that kind of diminishes the value of it being old, but, but you still can, you know, when, when it comes to clothes specifically, you can still get the right pants. It's a, like it that. reminds me of the uh, blue jeans designer in Zero History by William Gibson. Where mm. you know it's 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 a secret, and you have to be in the know to find out when she's going to show up and sell the sell the jeans, and it, it's like this super exclusive designer, and and that that's when everybody's got the nano pants, got the mems pants. It's going to be like a really huge prestige item to have handmade pants, or to have the originals, to have the ones that yeah. the patterns were made from. Totally. All right, let's take a uh, quick break and let you know forecast is brought to you by MailRoute at MailRoute.info. Anybody here host their own email themselves, like on a web host? Scott? Negative. No? Uh, you know what? That's not true. One of my frog pants addresses, I only have one address and it is hosted on, my, on that domain with the host I use right now. So I guess that's true. I do. I forward it all to Gmail, but um, it can be, if, if, without certain tools in our lives, it can be a huge pain to do that stuff. Uh, yeah, if you if you do any any hosting uh, and you know how to change your own MX records, then you might want to look at MailRoute. Uh, MailRoute was created by Tom Johnson. He wrote Microsoft's hosted exchange services. He wrote FrontBridge. Uh, then he moved on to write the what he calls the ultimate spam solution. I've been using it for about six months now, and it has resurrected an email address that I just could not use anymore. So you alter your MX records to have the mail go from your server through mail route and then back to your box and it kills all the spam. I mean, almost all the spam, I would say, except I've only ever had one email make it through in six months that could have been spam, but I wasn't entirely sure I hadn't signed up for it. So if I couldn't tell, <laughs> mail route certainly couldn't tell. Uh, and it, it, it's been it's been fantastic. Check it out at mailroute.info. Uh, if you're a small business or a family user, you run the web host for your family domain. Maybe you got a family name dot com, something like that. List price is thirty three dollars per year, but the Twit discounted price is twenty nine dollars and seventy cents per year, just under two dollars and fifty cents per month. But you can try it out for free. Go go check it out. Mailroute.info. We thank them for their support of Forecast. Time for the crazy predictions, and uh, Jerry, we'll start with you. Uh, one really out there forecast, like someday our brains will be in jars or something like that. I think the Earth is just going to be a bunch of rubble orbiting around the sun. I uh, predict that uh, we're going to be too lazy to figure out how to move a comet or a, a meteorite and uh, prevent it from hitting the Earth and just blammo. Our uh, government-induced uh, mind control drugs will uh, just make us a bunch of sheep. Do you have an idea of when this might happen? Uh, could happen tomorrow. Um, <laughs> we're already on our way. <laughs> well, yeah, can we I get some of these drugs? Can I get some of these mind control drugs that turn us into sheep now? That's my question. <laughs> well, you might want to take them if the meteorite's coming. <laughs> yeah, I, right. I, I'm saying, you know, I what predict I'm, we're going to lob wanna be... some bombs out there, but we're going to miss. Well, it's it's infinitely possible, right? Like, this is one of the things I always argue with people about. They like. It's so unlikely. The universe is too huge. It's infinite. There's no way we're ever going to get hit by one of these meteorites because it's just that the, the rarity is so whatever. But if, it's, if, the, if the universe is truly infinite, then we have an infinite possibility of being hit. So it may not be in our lifetimes. It may not be in the next hundred years. It may not be in a thousand years. But at some point somewhere, we are going to be hit by a meteorite because the possibilities are infinite. Well, because we already have been. Right. Yeah, it's going to happen. There's there's no question about it. And uh, as uh, humankind, we just don't care. You know, we just, our Monday night football is more important than anything science-based, so. Are you ready for destruction? <laughs> no. But football, no. yeah. I'm, I'm not ready with for that. destruction. <laughs>
<laughs> Are you ready for some? It's meteor? a great, it's a great future. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I think I don't know. I can't remember. I may be wrong about this, but Jerry may be the first person to predict total annihilation. <laughs> I think Len yes. Peralta predict oh, predicted like majority annihilation, but even he suggested some people would live on. But you're saying yeah. forget it. We're all going to be gone. Well, there, there might be some of us on the moon, but, you know, it's probably going to go spiraling off and get well, yeah, exactly. the sun or something. Um, and if you know, we, let's face it. The sun's going to expand and consume us anyway. So it's either now or right. then. Okay, but now do you think that as, as late as our government is, would they be smart enough to, you know, pull a Wally and, and send us all into these, you know, orbiting spacecrafts where we, you know, get big and fat and, and you know, drink things through tubes um, while we, you know, revolve around space but they'd be smart enough to do that and just be like okay abandon ship let's just mm. live in live in the strat let's just live in space well that's if well, we have warning right we gotta be we gotta have some kind of like oh it's coming and we're it's like armageddon that terrible movie where we gotta go up there and you know we have some time right, to right, try right. to try some plans or whatever even 2012 where and, and you know, Bruce just... Willis has to give his life so that Ben Affleck <laughs> and, and the Tyler can go on to make many more terrible movies for all of us yeah and put and put uh, animal crackers in each other's belly buttons. Yes, I'll never yes, forget exactly. that. Gross. But anyway, yeah, there that has to be. There, there has to be. I'm hoping that we get some warning. If it's sudden, but on the other hand, I kind of like the idea of a sudden thing that nobody knew was going to happen and was just flash and we're done. There's no pain. There's no prolonged disease. There's no, you know, all these after effects that come from that kind of disruption on an environmental level. Where let's say a, a third of the world survives, it's going to be a mess for those people. Um, I, I really like the science fiction notion that it's a flash, we're gone, we're done, nobody knew it was coming because it happened so fast. But up in the International Space Station, there's a Russian, an American, and a Japanese guy, and together... <laughs> They've got to figure out what to do. I mean, that sounds like a fun story to me. And they'll come back down. <laughs> and the hijinks <laughs> ensue. That sounds like a sitcom. That sounds like a sitcom from does. the 80s, you know? I would laugh. <laughs> a Russian, American, and a Japanese walk into a space station. <laughs> my my favorite space station. There you go. My favorite <laughs> space station. And a monkey. Yes, That's you got to have the monkey. Yeah. As, as who, who, you know... Comic Darn relief. you, monkey. You sorted okay. our attempt to get back to... The civilization again. Wait, oh, <laughs> what'd you do with the spanner? Uh, yeah, well, at least those three people will be in, entertained after the entire Earth is uh, destroyed. I, yeah, but they won't be able to reproduce. I mean, it really will be a comedy of errors. It'll be like, you know, they're it. They're, that's all there is. And then maybe they get lucky and find out that they, they get down there finally. They spend a bunch of time in this barren wasteland. They, it's barely breathable air. But there's a mutant uh, Amazon women's camp that springs up, and I got this whole. Oh, so all, thing. it's all three guys on the International Space. I was assuming one of it, like the Russian or the American was a woman. No, no, they're all dudes, man. Okay, dude, dude, city up there, and then they're and they'll decry that, or like you know, women did make a lot of inroads into the space program, but not nearly enough. Because now look at us, three of us up here were all dudes. <laughs> Didn't you Sally Ride? Why couldn't you have done more? Yeah. Right. I only have one problem with this this thing, uh, this prediction, Jerry, which is you are assuming, you're making the assumption that we are not living in a simulation. Is that correct? Well, I mean, uh, the computers would get wiped out when the meteor hit us anyway if we were in a simulation. So I think it still holds. So the meteor could hit the civilization that is running the computer that has the simulation in which we are living. Yeah, we better have some good redundancy on another planet or, yeah. or we're done for. Okay. So it works either way. You're right. Okay. No, no obje <laughs> objection withdrawn. <laughs> Let's move over to you, Christina. Your crazy ass prediction in 2000 years will all be sheep or whatever you got. Time frame yeah, doesn't okay. matter. So, so my crazy ass prediction is actually, uh, all right. So did you guys ever see that really terrible movie, Waterworld? Oh yeah. Yes. I love, I love Waterworld because it is so bad. Yes. Great okay. Movie. Yeah. Okay. I saw that in the theater. I think I was like, I was like 12 or 13. And my dad actually liked it. He's like the one person in the world who liked it. He also liked The Postman. My, my dad clearly has a thing has for really Kevin Costner. Taste. Yeah, he does have a thing for really terrible <laughs> Kevin Costner movies. But I was thinking about this the other day. I was, I was writing something about some of the, the, the best, uh, you know, tech geek films, you know, of the current kind of era. I was thinking about some how, you know, really awful movie. But I was thinking, you know, it would be kind of interesting if, if we all ended up living underwater. Oh, and, like, and um, we got plenty of room for that. The exactly. planet's mostly water. 
Well, exactly. It's like, you know, things are expanding so much. If we were able to actually create societies underwater and whether, you know, we ended up evolving into such a way so that we could be more breathable or the technology was there so that we have, you know, pods and, and oxygen was able to come in other ways or whatnot. But if, you know, it, it's like the Little Mermaid or, or Waterworld, but not really lame or with a, a Disney soundtrack. Well, it makes sense. I mean, you're a little bit more protected underwater. So, you know, when the meteorite's right. coming, get underwater. <laughs> That's right. Seas may boil a little. <laughs> a little bit. Whatever. Just a tiny bit. I, I love this idea. I love the... I mean, actually, I think the worst part of Waterworld was the gills and that whole thing. I thought that was sort of silly the way they handled it. But the idea that, that, the, that we would have to move down uh, is not that crazy to me. In fact, really all it's going to take is for us to, to get on the stick and figure out some... I sound like I make it sound like it's easy, but figure out a way to deal with the pressure problem. If we can figure out a way to deal with that, I don't know what that is, but some kind of tech that'll that'll keep that that millions of pounds of pressure from crushing us as we go lower and lower. There's all sorts of possibilities of building domes down there and 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 vast cities with you know. All but do we have to go all the way down? Can we just go yeah. a mile down? Sure, why not? I mean, I don't know what the tectonic plates and the way they work under the ocean and all that stuff would have. Uh, you know, what, what effect that would have, if any, um, we'd still have to be careful, I guess, about where we built and, and how we were fastened to the to the seafloor and things like that. But we wouldn't even necessarily have to be fastened to the seafloor. We could just be living at depth, but floating. Yeah. And artificial sunlight and artificial ways of sort of getting some of the things we as humans have evolved to need, uh, I think are possible. So, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's that crazy. I say let's let's go. It's Sea Lab 2012 or whatever that was called. What was that C show called? Yes. Sequest, not Sea Lab. Sea Lab is a cartoon. C C yeah, Sea Lab is the cartoon. It's Sequest DSP. Was that it? <laughs> yeah, with Roy Scheider and uh, nobody else that I can think of. Yeah, that was the one that Steven Spielberg's uh, production company made. That was like their, that was DreamWorks' first TV show, I think. Yeah, and they, I mean, they had basically envisioned a, a world of underwater exploration and therefore expansion and. I don't know. I like that idea. I liked. Uh, I like the ideas that were in. Um, I mean, we <laughs> movies are such inspiration for technology and, and changes anyway. But uh, what's the one? Oh, the Abyss. James Cameron's The Abyss yeah, is yeah. a great, great look at what it would be like to really explore these places that we've never been able to get to. If we could just get over that pressure stuff, it's like this weird barrier. If we can get past that, we're you know we're in for some interesting discoveries. I think. Well, it's the same thing as going into space, right? I mean, in, in space, you have to deal with a lack of oxygen and a vacuum and a, and a pressure problem of its own. Uh, yeah. It's just you know it, you have to deal with a different kind of environment going down into the sea. That was the whole idea, uh, I think, with Sequest was to show the the untapped frontier that we need to explore right here on our own world without even getting off this rock necessarily. And that's it's a lot of unused land that could be developed into malls. And fast food stores and all kinds of businesses. You could have a you could have a sea world within under the sea, like that would be kind of cool. Would you have land oh, yeah. land world? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh. Yeah, you could have something like that where you'd have like land world where it'd be like, this is what it's like to have, you know, With a like simulated a, sun a or whatever. Fake sun, yeah, lizards. Yeah, but that would be the whole point is you would recreate. I mean, we would we'd try to do this the best we could on another planet. I think we would try to you know on the moon. I can't imagine we'd be like. All right, well, we got these helmets, so we may as well just get used to all this dust and rock. I think they would, they would build domes and, and structures that would, that would house the things that, you know, that we see as earthly pleasures and nature and stuff. And I think that's, it would provide us with oxygen as well. So I feel like those kinds of things would endure. They're, they're not going to go away. I hope we uh, learn what w from the Metrodome <laughs> in building these domes, though, because I, I don't want to see all that water crashing through the like did you see that with the snow that was awesome it was like watching the best special effects ever it was <laughs> and the, the footage was like the, the thing that impressed me is the footage is such good quality you could use it in a movie if somebody had the rights i bet somebody will eventually someday either buy yeah. the rights or you know it goes into public domain in a thousand years whenever public domain lasts till <laughs> wasn't uh, there someone running it looked like there was someone running down on the field as it I was caving tell. down in yeah i couldn't tell if that you was imagine? a person or just or just a shadow but yeah no kidding <laughs> that was that was that was good stuff all right but that's present we can't talk about that on the show. <laughs> yeah. uh it is time now to move on to four questions scott johnson Mm, four questions where we ask you rapid fire style four questions you cannot wait to answer these you got to go from the gut first thing that pops out of your head 
I'm going to start and I'm going to ask my questions of who am I asking? I forget. Jerry. <laughs> oh, Jerry. Jerry, <laughs> are you ready for your four questions? Bring it on. All right. Here we go. And the 2010 Academy Award for Best Picture goes to? Oh, I don't follow movies. Uh... Dang it. <laughs> Should have asked me that wow, one. Wow, went, went super short term with that one. <laughs> yeah, I did kind of. Uh, that's okay. We will we'll skip that one. Move to the next one. If you could create the robot that will eventually destroy all mankind, what name do you give him? Trogdor. Trogdor, nice. Wait a minute. Isn't that, was that a, a Homestar Runner character? Of yes. course. Yeah, okay. Just checking. Oh, I think I would do the same. If they were all inhabitable and the Earth was dying, on which of our remaining solar system's planets would you prefer to live? Pluto. Because it's dark and, and I kind of... Not a planet. ...like the dark. <laughs> oh, I, would, I would make it a planet. <laughs> I was really hoping Tom would say that, if the answer was Pluto. All my plans are coming together today. All right. Number four, is it already? Yeah, it is. You've heard of acid, heavy metal, grunge, ska, Britpop, etc. What subcategory name will be applied to rock and roll in the next decade? Scuba diving. <laughs> scuba rock. <laughs> hey, man, scuba is that rock. scuba rock? <laughs> well, balance the pressures out. You know what? That's not bad. That actually, I mean, I don't know what that'll sound like, but I could totally see somebody pointing it and calling it that. Sure. Well, it'll, it'll go with our move into the underwater cities. Yeah. Yes. We'll all sit around rocking out to scuba rock while the meteors <laughs> rain down upon us. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to start my scuba rock band now. This is awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, good job. <laughs> all right, Christina, it is time for your four questions. Are you sitting comfortably? I am. Good. Then we will begin. Question number one. In the future, where we can pick what monster we want to be. What will be the most popular monster? Godzilla. Oh, just a race of Godzillas. Yes. Wow. That'll be a mess. And then when you pick Godzilla, do people go, oh, you picked Godzilla? Exactly. Even though <laughs> everyone out. really wanted to pick Godzilla and yeah. then just pretending like they're too cool to be Godzilla. Yeah, I used to be Godzilla before it became so popular. Exactly. Well, he's from the sea, so there's a... Ah, another tie-in. No, but I'm the original, you know, black and white, you know, 1930s Godzilla. <laughs> yeah. I'm hipster Godzilla. <laughs> hipster I'm Godzilla, Godzilla before he was, you know, made into um, big, big time. Godzilla in skinny pants. Exactly. <laughs> Question number two. Will humanity ever appreciate good architecture? No. Yeah, I was afraid you were going <laughs> to <laughs> there's, there's really no follow-up to that. Question number three. What animal will be the next on Earth to gain sentience? The hippopotamus. <laughs> oh, man. Awesome. I love hippos. I can't wait to see that breaking news story. <laughs> Scientists have determined hippopotami have gained sentience. We take you to darkest Africa. Sentience and hippopotami in the same sentence. What would they? Wow. What would they do? Like, what would be their their great work? Uh, we need fish. Uh, so <laughs> we have these ideas. I don't know. Do they eat fish? I don't even know. Maybe they'd build the underwater cities. Uh, That's exactly it. Question number four: If you could mash up three people to revive as a Frankensteinian clone, who would they be? Three people to to revive as a Frankenstein clone. Okay, so um, Paul Lind. Nice center square. Uh, center yeah, square, yeah, exactly. baby. So you use his there. torso and his voice box, I guess. Exactly, Paul Lind, um, Truman Capote, mm. and uh, Charles Nelson Riley. Oh my gosh! You you said the name I had in my. You, you just picked three guys from like the same class. Exactly. Class. I'm thinking like Warcraft, but that's funny. Oh Paul gosh, Nelson funny. Capote. Precisely. They'd be bitchy I and they'd be it. funny and they'd like have really good quips. They'd have it'd be like the best line Frankenstein thing ever. The most quotable monster ever created by science. Exactly. Oh, that's a great <laughs> idea. Um, but for bonus points, by the way, since we didn't get an answer on the Academy Award, in 2010, who wins the best picture? Just curious. The Social Network. Oh, all right. I'm going Inception. I, uh, I hear 
that's uh, based on a true story. Is that right? S supposedly. Yeah. Supposedly. Uh, I think about... Inception's actually, that's a, that's a pretty good guess, too. Mm. Yeah. I would like it I'm, to be I'm, I'm, I'm going, I don't know, the, the, um, the way that the awards are, are leaning now, it, we'll have to see when the BAFTAs come out to, to be able to do our um, rankings and, and get all um, antithetical about it. But right now, mm -hmm. in, um, social network's leading. Gotcha. Uh, Jerry, since since you you uh, we I feel like we gypped you out of out of a question. Is there one of Christina's questions that you would like to also answer? Oh, uh, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> 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 Zone that right out. <laughs> uh, do you think humanity will ever appreciate good architecture? Of course they will. Of course really? they will. Our yeah. underwater cities are going to be beautiful. They'll be finally in the underwater cities. We will gain. Yes. Widespread. Anne Rand will be so happy. <laughs> we'll, we'll appreciate good structural integrity is what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, that for sure. That may be yeah. what, what leads to that eventually. All right. Well, thank you both uh, very much. Jerry Ellsworth, self-taught electrical engineer, ex race car driver, and aspiring improv actress. Uh, let folks know where they can find your work online. Uh, almost everywhere. Jerry Ellsworth, Twitter, Facebook, uh, YouTube. A lot of my work goes to YouTube. Crazy and science experiments there. It's J E R R. Or I'm sorry, J E R I. Yeah, yeah. Elsewhere. Who knows what you'll get if you spell it any of the other variants? Mm -hmm. uh, Christina Warren, writer for Mashable, co host of Briefly Awesome. Let them know where they can find Briefly Awesome and any of the other stuff you do. Uh, Briefly Awesome is at 5x5.tv. And um, you can find my work at Mashable and follow me on Twitter or any of the other networks. I'm film underscore girl. Excellent. Thank you both for being on the show. Scott Johnson, anything else we need to uh, take care of before we finish up here? Just a reminder that uh, people can, uh, they can follow us on Twitter too. Tom's at Ace Detect. I'm at Extra Life. And if you want to uh, watch another great show on this uh, every weekend, every Friday that is, watch Current Geek Weekly right here on Twit at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern. It's a great, great show about the geekier things in our lives. And uh, we bring it to you, rocking it every Friday night. So uh, check that out. CurrentGeek.com is the website. Don't forget to leave comments at our website, ForecastPodcast.com, or send us an email, ForecastPodcast at gmail.com. We'll see you next time. Bye. It's only 32 years away. <laughs>